Uh, and then later on, I started, of course, getting into hardware and software. I've always been a hardware person, uh, but I've been an analog guy. I mean, I used analog circuits and building Chevy Chev and Butterworth filter circuits for my voice scrambler. And uh, I learned all my digital electronics from, uh, from Waz and Jobs. Jobs really wasn't uh, the technical person as, as, as Wozniak was. But uh, I eventually got a chance to, uh, to build the telephone interface board through Apple. But the biggest problem, I couldn't market it because you had to buy this $100 a month device that hooked to the phone company that interfaced between your device and the phone company. Two years later, DC Hayes comes out with the DC Hayes modem. So we were just a little bit too early in our coming out with the phone board. So at that particular point in time, I ran into a little bit of trouble in Pennsylvania when I had a party. And uh, some people got hold of my telephone line without my permission and hooked the Charlie board, which is my phone interface board, to the phone line, started scanning on my phone line. And I was out walking in the woods, and I see three helicopters and 20 state troopers uh, <laughs> riding ponies through the, through the forest. And uh, we come back, and this was where I got busted the second time. Uh, but I wasn't uh, my doing, sort of. And so I, went, I had to go back to California to deal with the probation revocation hearing. And uh, Ron Barkin, my attorney, uh, says, instead of putting him in jail, let's put him in the work furlough program. But the federal system didn't have a work furlough program. So he pulled some strings and got the work furlough program for the federal authorities to agree to put me into a work furlough program. So I got sentenced to six months, which really turned out to only be four months. And uh, I'd go to jail at night. And, uh, when, and then they would let me out during the daytime, and I would drive to this office space that I rented out from these Berkeley hippie people that liked to, to practice bands. It was a band practice area. And it said, Receiving on the door. And they called themselves Receiving Studios. And uh, during that time was when I was developing Easy Rider. I had an Apple II. Woz would come over with a QM printer and let me use his QM printer. So it was a first word processor program that did direct proportional spacing, not just characters, character spacing, not word spacing, on a QM printer, OK? And we were demonstrating it at the 4th West Coast Computer Fair. Beautiful inner relationship we had. We were at the Apple Pie booth, right next door to the 4th Interest Group booth. The Apple Pie booth was the Apple, and the fourth interest group people were the fourth people. So if you're in the fourth group booth, you say, what program is written in fourth? They point to the Apple Pie booth. Apple Pie people say, well, well what's Easy Rider written in? Fourth. And they point to the fourth booth. So, and so we were selling them for $69.69. We couldn't make the discs fast enough. But uh, we continue marketing it. And we got a, a company called Information Unlimited Software, and we marketed it. And uh, that was sort of how Easy Rider got started back in the day. So the work furlough program was wonderful. I'd go home, uh, I'd print out a hard copy listing of, of, the, uh, of the program, I'd drive back to jail, I'd get back into my skivvies again, go back into my room and just, just stick my head in the code as if I knew what I was doing, and uh, started marking up the code and looking at the changes. So I was basically conceptualizing the code in my head, not getting on the computer. It was the most ideal programming situation that I ever had. I wish I had that today. <laughs> it would have been a lot more uh, thing. So at the end of the day, I'd print the fresh source code. I'd come back the next day and uh, type it in, get it all working again, and got, it, got Easy Writer, the word processor program, done in three months, just in time for the fourth West Coast Computer Fair. And uh, with my knowledge of the fourth kernel, I was able to build a source-level debugger. And uh, we, got, we got the Apple Core booth. We had a very good symbiotic relationship. Huge crowds viewed the demo. We had, we had people like Hayden Books just drooling over the program. We had probably four of the major software houses wanted it. Broderbund, uh, Hayden Books, Information Unlimited Software offered us the best royalty figures. So, and that's what we finally chose, Information Unlimited Software. We eventually came out with, uh, with uh, an IBM version of it. We all BM for IBM. 
uh, Easy Writer, at that time we went to a 80-column uh, version of Easy Writer and uh, proportional spacing. We demonstrated it at a word processor convention in Minneapolis and with an Apple II. <laughs> and IBM, of course, started sneaking around looking for people to put products on their new IBM PC about a year before they even came out with it. And we uh, struck a deal with IBM PC to come, well, with Easy Writer for the IBM PC. And what pure luck we had. We knew that they had an 8088 processor. We also knew that an 8088 processor was the same thing as an 8086 processor, which was a 16-bit version of an 8088 processor. So while we went out, and with the money that we were making with the original Easy Writer, we bought a giant uh, TEI mainframe S100 system with 8-inch eight, eight floppy disks, 256K uh, of memory, and, uh, and I, I hired the best 8086 programmer I could get my hands on, and then we wrote what, we, what I call the VMI, the Virtual Machine Interface, which now we call them drivers. And uh, we got the VMI, we got the fourth working on the thing in about a week. Uh, we got the FIG fourth source code and we just simply typed it in. We got it all working. And then when our IBM PCs came, we looked at that machine and we laughed. A separate keyboard, oh my God. But what a keyboard it was. Clackety, clackety, clack. Good, positive finger contact, man. My fingers flew on that <coughs> keyboard. I loved it. And so uh, I'd, I'd be sitting back with a keyboard on my lap like this, looking at the monitor, which is many feet away. <laughs> and uh, when we got the, when we got, when IBM PC finally came in to deliver the, the IBM PCs, there was nothing, not, there was no markings on it or nothing. And so uh, I went to, uh, I went to look at the DOS, and it says MS-DOS 1.0. Well, it just so happens that on our TEI mainframe, we purchased Seattle Computer Product DOS, written by Patterson. Patterson just happens to have sold that DOS to IBM and Microsoft. So we used the same DOS that the IBM PC had, but we had it all along, and we didn't even know it until actually we got the IBM PC. And when I looked at that IBM PC and I said DIR and it came back and says A greater than, oh my God, I couldn't believe it. So I looked at Doug, Doug looked at me and says, we, look, we, we immediately grabbed the serial uh, port. We took the, uh, we took the, the bin hex of fourth.hex, which was generated using the DEI mainframe, and we, it was just a text file. We moved the text file over to the IBM PC and we ported forth. 15 minutes. But here's a really cool thing. We negotiated our deal with IBM PC. They asked me, how long will it take to get fourth on the IBM PC? And we says, six months. And he says, you can get it done that soon. <laughs> <laughs> so I go upstairs to the main office. And I says, Bill, you better bring your IBM croonies downstairs right away to the lab and check this out. And they were turning green. They, they had thought something went wrong with their IBM PC. So they came down there, and I said to them, do you remember when I told you guys we can get forth working on your system in six months? I said, he says, yeah, well, guess what? I lied. <laughs> it's already on it. <laughs> the next day, the editor was fully functional and working because the VMIs worked perfect. So we, now we had a uh, Corvus, uh, we had a Corvus 100 megabyte hard drive that all of our source code was on it. And the Corvus hard disk used ribbon cable, and we had about five or six Macintoshes all networked together on a ribbon cable to, uh, to share easier at or across a uh, group of, uh, of us developers. And uh, we had to get the uh, IBM PC to work on the Corvus. All they gave us was a parallel card. Using my knowledge of uh, digital electronics, I took that parallel card, lifted the read-write pin off of the read-write bidirectional gate chip, and uh, reversed the logic, hooked it up to the read-write line on the Corvus, and oh my god, we had to kind of fiddle around with a little bit of timing issues, but we got it to read the data from the Corvus onto the IBM PC and vice versa. Now we had the EasyWriter source. 
that we can now build directly from the original Apple source because it was just absolute, totally machine portable. But the next day, IBM people brought their engineering from Boca Raton, Florida down there. And they says, how did you interface it to the Corvus? I says, oh, I just used your parallel card. And it says, I just lifted the read-write uh, read pin off the chip here and uh, hooked the gate to it and uh, added a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of extra code to get the delay right so that we would wait for the Corvus to get ready for the data. And he says, you butchered our card? <laughs> they freaked out. They took the card away from us. The only way we could now get the data off of the Easy Writer was through the serial port, and that would take an Apple computer as well. So we had to use an Apple II going through the serial port to the IBM PC to build Easy Writer. And that was how we built Easy Writer to the thing. And that's sort of how I got started in involved in, in uh, how I got Easy Writer going on the IBM PC. Uh, now let me talk a little bit now about some other things. Um, I want to talk about current events. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about my plans to write a book. Uh, this summer, I went down to southern Spain to work with my co-author and my editor. And uh, I've been working with him every day on Skype, getting our book finalized and putting it together. We're probably going to put a Kickstarter project. And I'm thinking of actually taking this Captain Crunch whistle and 3D printing it and making it available for people who donate to our Kickstarter. It's just a possibility. We're not really sure. Uh, but my views on current event, Anonymous uh, did a really cool thing just last week, actually. Uh, there was this company that was selling this life-saving drug, and they raised the price of that drug 4,000%, which completely locked everybody out of the drug. Well, Anonymous found out where that guy lived published it on the net. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, Adrian Lamo, of course, is the snitch and the, and the traitor, and his actions against Chelsea and Manning were pretty much uncalled for. Shame on the military for even allowing Manning to even take his MP3 player into a classified environment. And of course, Julian is our hero, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, Snowden. And now let's talk a little bit about security because I want to kind of end, the, end my whole talk about how you can protect your privacy. Now we all know the Snowden revelations. We all know how easy it is for them to tap your phone now and how they can get and scoop up your information. There are programs out there now that I can turn you on to which are really, really good. One of them is, is the most prolific program that I know of called Wicker, W-I-C-K-R, without the E. Written by uh, Nico Sell. She is a DEF CON attendee. She wanders around DEF CON with big dark glasses. She values her privacy just religiously. And she's done a wonderful job developing a program that is absolutely as easy to use as SMS text. No keys. It generates a session key. The session key is basically, uh, it's basically hashed into a, uh, into a hash code. It's the hash code that's sent up into the cloud that identifies you to the server. So there's no metadata. There's no record of the call being made. It uses 256 AES military grade encryption. It's free, called Wicker. It runs on iOS, Android, Mac OS, Windows, Linux, PCs, all of them. And that's the most prolific program. Now, Snowden recommends that we use the red phone for the Android. And there's another program on the, on the iOS now, the Apple II, called Signal. And uh, Signal and uh, the red phone is the same concept. They're just different names, but they can communicate with each other. And then on the Android, there is another program called Text Secure. Uh, that, the same code of Text Secure has also been put into Signal. So Signal now can do two things. It can do text and voice, as opposed to two different programs doing text and voice on the Android. Uh, many, many other programs out there. Why don't you see me after the, after the lecture's over, and I'll give you all, all the dirty uh, information you need to how you can protect your privacy. But uh, this is what I try to do now, and I'm going around the world talking about things. Uh, just so you know, next, uh, next week there's the, uh, there is the uh, computer uh, uh, that's going on in Berlin. 
uh, in Germany, uh, the Vintage Computer Festival. I'll be giving a talk there next week, along with Steve, uh, Steve uh, I mean Lee Felsenstein of the Homebrew fame. He's the Toastmaster of the Homebrew Computer Club, and I'll be there giving a talk in Germany. I think it'll be on the third at noon. And you can see me after the meeting, or you can contact uh, some of the staff here as to uh, how to get access to the, uh, the uh, Vintage Computer Festival in Germany. Then there's the Tor Conference, which is happening right now as well. Uh, Tor Conference is, I just actually had a good, good long talk with Jake Applebaum at the uh, Tufelsberg Spy Museum. <laughs> he brought his people up there, and, uh, and I met with Jake and had a good long talk with Jake, and I'm going to get a chance to talk to the Tor people because I'm just now working on this thing called the Anana Box. I'll show it to you guys after my talk. It's a small little box. You put it in your backpack, and you don't have to have any Tor software installed on your computer at all. You just simply access that box through a Wi-Fi, through a 192.168.11, and uh, it just goes to a, we a web site. You log into this website. You pick the SSID of your cafe you're logged into, and uh, so you've got two Wi-Fi connections. That's a bridge now. It bridges anything you want to connect to that thing, your, your iPhone, your Android, your laptop, whatever. And it's a direct tour router, which is way cool. Okay, before we go into any questions, I just wanted to say that uh, the person that's doing this in Nanobox, his name is uh, his name is August. He just recently did a Kickstarter, but the Kickstarter people kind of got on his case, and he would have raised a lot of money had Kickstarter people been a little bit more lenient with some of his his things. So, uh, so I, I I myself, my role with him is just nothing more than an advisor, and this is pretty much what I do now is other than me working on my book, I am, a, I am an advisor to companies now. And uh, I, basically, uh, look, I basically work out of the box, and I find things that people don't realize, and I see things that people can't see. And I direct people, and I, I'm going to go to Tor next week. I'm going to ask these Tor people what they want this Tor router to have. I'll be very carefully taking notes and making sure that they're going to be real happy with the new product when it comes out. Thank you.